It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going, because they were holding on to something, that there is some good in this world, and it's worth fighting for. Today on Pop Culture Catechism, in anticipation of the new Rings of Power series releasing on Amazon Prime this fall, we are talking about the Lord of the Rings. Welcome to Pop Culture Catechism, conversations about music, movies, and the longings of the human heart. Let's get started. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the evil in the world? Are you ever overcome by the temptations within yourself? Do you long for a life of grand adventure and significance? Do you dream of being a great hero? Or do you yearn for a simple existence with a few close friends and family? And what does true friendship look like, both in times of great evil and adversity and in times of peace? and blessing. Today, we will tackle these questions and much more with the help of one of the great intellects of the 20th century and indeed of history, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, who I will probably call Tolkien throughout because that's just how I've always said his name, even though I know it's wrong. <laughs> But that's what we're going to talk about today on Pop Culture Catechism. This is Pop Culture Catechism, the gospel according to pop music and movies, where we look for God's love and the media that you're plugged into, so that then after the show, when we unplug, we can actually go live the gospel in the real world. And our goal by the end of this episode is that you'll not only have a deeper understanding and appreciation for the world of Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, but also you'll have some applicable practical, actionable steps that you can do today to help live the gospel better in your life and to know God's love more deeply in your own heart. My name is Mike Tenney. I'm a Catholic speaker and worship leader from Washington, D.C. I spent over a decade teaching Catholic high school theology and also trying to make it big as a rock star. And now I'm blessed to speak to thousands of people each year at events all over the place and through this show, Pop Culture Catechism. A special thank you to our patrons who make this show possible through popculturecatechism.com. I am very pleased and once again honored to be joined by, I think, my most frequent guest, uh, the guy I go to when I need to talk about epic fantasy, uh, your friend and mine. You know him from the other, uh, one of the other great shows on Awaken Catholic, Elevate Ordinary. He is also uh, works for the Coming Home Network, and we'll, you'll see him a lot more on the Coming Home Network as he's going to be the new host of The Journey Home. This is, you know him, I know him, John Mark Grodi. Welcome, John Mark. Back to the show. Thanks, Mike. I'm so glad to be here. It's yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, it's we been kind of, have. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of been cool over the, the past couple of years that I've been involved at Awaken Catholic. You and I have kind of gotten to become friends, not because we've spent that much time together, but because every few months we have these deep conversations about the like the biggest questions of the world. <laughs> And it's, I love uh, it. I love uh, it. Yeah. it's about like 21 pilots or Star Wars or Dune or yeah. I, so anyway, thanks for coming Each back. one of those conversations come back to my mind frequently. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll, my mind will flip back to those conversations and some of the fruit that came out of them. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I want to go right back to them. I want to, I want to pick up right where we left <laughs> off. And so I'm glad yeah. to be here for a new chapter in that. So. Awesome. Yeah. I just re-listened to the 21 pilots episode. It was one of our first ones. It was maybe the second episode we ever yeah. recorded. And I was like, and I tend to think of my early episodes is like not very good, but I was leaning out to that one. And I was like, man, this, this is actually a pretty good episode. So listeners, if you haven't listened to that one, yeah. go back and listen to the 21 pilots blurry face. That was really good. So, um, John Mark, tell me a little bit more about yourself. If uh, there's anything I missed that you want the beautiful people to know. Well, I think I think I have a, another kid since last time we talked. Oh yeah, uh, congratulations! Mary Prudence was born a few months ago. Yeah, so she's doing well. The family's doing well. Um, and as you noted, um, I have the I work for the Coming Home Network International, the apostolate that my father founded to help people become Catholic. I'm the executive director over there. But also, uh, more recently, I'm. Uh, we've announced that I'm taking over for my dad as host uh, of the Journey Home program on EWTN. So I'll be there every week on Monday nights at 8 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time, uh, helping people to share their conversion stories with the world, t talking about how they came to know Christ and then how he led them deeper into his heart, into his body, the church. Uh, it's a really awesome privilege that I'm blessed for. So that's a, that's a new update that I'm 
pretty excited about. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, of course, on your new babies, both you and your wife, Teresa. And um, congratulations on the show. Yeah, the, the, the journey home, there, there's so many just awesome stories of, of, of people coming to the faith and coming back to the faith. Uh, the president of Awakening Catholic, Nick De La Torre, he, w- he was on an episode. Um, uh, we had a, a, one of the guys that was the guest on our Hamilton episode, David, he was also uh, featured on uh, the journey home. So it's just, it's a great way to hear stories of all the various different ways that people are coming to Christ and coming to the church. Which I love it. So excited yeah. for you. Well, and I'll just say real quickly here, we'll, we'll obviously talk more about this in this episode, but there's a connection between this notion of the conversion story or people telling their testimony, their story, and the importance of, of fictional works like Lord of the Rings. Uh, because, uh, I mean, for a number of reasons. Number one, that story narrative is one of the primary ways that humans share with each other. As Christians, it's one of the primary ways that we share the gospel. We don't primarily do it through uh, propositions or through mere kind of doctrinal uh, theological uh, type stuff. We, we share stories. I mean, you can you can share all this stuff theoretically, but people want to see, they need to know, they need to see the evidence that Christ has made a difference in your life. So your story is so important. Uh, hearing stories is so important, but also recognizing that, again, you you live in a story. That's yes. that's the deeper, that's the, uh, Chesterton had a saying that uh, romance is deeper than reality. And Ooh. one of the uh-huh. things I take away from that is that the normal reality we experience, um, we're only seeing a very, very small glimmer of the truth. And we need to be reminded by things like Lord of the Rings that actually the deeper reality is that this is a big grand fairy tale that we're in. That's the deeper reality. It's true. It's easy to forget in, in day-to-day life. And so, yeah, stories are so important. Right? Yeah. And well, and Tolkien kind of in the middle of the 20th century when he was writing the Lord of the Rings and he was writing it right just before World War II and during World War II and a little bit after World War II is like the biggest events some of the biggest events of history are happening and he himself fought in World War I and he's got all that going on in the back of his brain and he'd previously written The, the Hobbit and then he had all this background lore behind it which is, then became the Silmarillion right. but as he's writing that he ha- he's crystallizing this theory of fantasy or what he calls fairy and he has a great um, little essay called On Fairy fairy or on fairy stories where basically he's defending the fantasy genre because the fantasy genre yeah. in the, the 20th century had kind of um, become not respected, especially in academic circles. And he and C.S. Lewis specifically are credited with revitalizing fantasy literature. And people said, oh, yeah. it's just escapism. You're just escaping from the real world. And Tolkien would say, well, yeah, you're, you're supposed to escape from a cage. <laughs> So this is what it does. It allows you to see with more real eyes and, and, and we learn from history. And that's why he made this fantastical history of Middle Earth because he says that's how humans learn. We learn from story. We learn from history. And if you look at what the Bible is, most of the Bible is just the history of God's relationship with the people that he loves. And so right. you won't find kind of these one-to-one comparisons like you will in some ways when in C.S. Lewis's like Narnia works where it's like, okay, Aslan the lion, basically Jesus. <laughs> and you won't, you won't find that because he says we're uh, even even from these fantastical histories, we still learn, and we still learn what it means to be to be human. To, again, to use C.S. Lewis's um, understanding, you go into the wardrobe, and then you come back into the real world changed. And the things you experienced in the wardrobe, even though they're fantastical, they're real, and in some ways they're more real than the real world. And at the end, you'll actually get yeah. to see it with the eyes of God. Um, so anyway, that's that's what we get to do when we go into yeah. fantasy stories like that. We go into the wardrobe for a little bit, and we come back. We're supposed to be transformed. Yeah, I think the more meaningful distinction between what we might negatively call like escapist fiction or literature and then what Tolkien is talking about, I think comes down more to how we consider art in general. One of my personal favorite definitions of art is art is that which reveals. Mm. Okay, art reveals. Now, counterfeits of art don't reveal, they conceal. Pornography conceals. Ooh. Marketing conceals. Propaganda okay. conceals yes. reality. Whereas true art, all good art, breaks open reality and helps you to see deeper in, into it. Again, whether it's a beautiful painting or a very ugly, beautiful painting, you know, <laughs> you know, painting of, of great pain or, or, or difficulty, uh, or a movie like The Passion of the Christ, all kinds of real, true, good art, they break open reality. And, and reveal more of it to you. And so, again, sometimes some things reveal like historical events, like we you read a great biography of somebody. That's a work of art in a certain sense. Lord of the Rings doesn't necessarily uh, describe real human history, 
but it does break open aspects of reality. It's it's true art in that sense. And so it's it's escapism in the sense of escaping from your lived reality, which is often very narrow, yeah. and it's you you very easily forget the truths that are just below the surface. There, it breaks that op reality back open. As you said, it helps you to pop out of that cage you've been stuck in and get back to the real world. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so let's since we're talking about art. For, normally on my shows, I tend to talk about what we love artistically about the piece of art we're talking about, and then we'll talk about the spiritual theme. So let's talk about artistically. What do you love about Lord of the Rings? We're talking about the movies. We're talking about the books. We're talking about all things Lord of the Rings. You want to go first? You want me to go first? Uh, well, I can start a little bit. Um, I'll start with the book. We can maybe, maybe then go into the movie in a little bit here. I mean, one of the, the things I love about the book, I, I always, I'm really sensitive in different fictional works to um, the the whole kind of the atmosphere of the whole book, right? You have characters, you have plot, you have the specific things that are said and done. But then there's the question of whether uh, an author can paint a world that feels real, that feels alive. Uh, and the whole atmosphere of Lord of the Rings is one of the, one of the aspects of that I most appreciate. I mean, we'll talk more about it later, but that's when we think when we, we try to understand why it's so meaningful to us and to so many people. It's precisely that the world that you're, you enter into, uh, is so real. It's so lifelike. Uh, the, the moral universe is so palpable, just like ours. Um, the 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 cause and effect the providence and free will all that is kind of baked into the world yeah. uh, it comes out in the in the dialogue it comes out in the action but it, the whole world it it's like coming home right when you read Lord of the Rings it's a little bit like you're you're coming back to a remembered place uh, because of its just because of the world building yeah, how, there. So how I, many that's how many times part of it that how I many times would you say you've read Lord of the Rings. Oh, 10 plus. Oh, wow. Okay. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I've read, I mean, different formats. Yeah. I think I've, I think yeah. I've, re I read it once about every five to 10 years. So I think I just reread it this past year. I think that was my fifth or sixth reading. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Most people, well, especially if you're counting audio books yeah, now, that uh -huh. makes it really easy uh -huh. to reread stuff. <laughs> so I love what you said about the, the world that it's in. Cause it's, he wrote it intentionally to be like ancient literature, to be like the Bible, to be like Beowulf, to be like this amalgam this this collection of ancient stories that were probably passed down by word of mouth and then were eventually edited and so you know if you read the bible there's a bunch of different narrators sometimes you just randomly get songs in the middle of what's going on and that is very much how lord of the rings is is randomly um you know aragorn will go off into a song about like something that just happened you know or or sam will sing a song or somebody will sing a song the elves will be singing songs um and then you kind of get these mm -hmm. like off you'll get these like random glimpses into other things in the world. They start talking about Numenor and you're like, what's, what's Numenor? And like Frodo will cry out some elven thing and you're like, what, where, what's that a reference to, you know? And, and um, hmm. then you'll like, there's definitely tone shifts. Like there's parts where the language becomes like much more noble. Like when Aragorn's giving a great speech. Um, and then in the early parts of the book, you'll, you know, the parts that are supposedly written by Bilbo, you get this whole thing about Tom Bombadil, which doesn't really affect the rest of the story, but it's the sort of thing Bilbo would find fascinating. And then like the later stuff that's a little darker is more written by Frodo. And then the end of it is written by Sam. And even, eventually it's, it's given even to, to Sam's daughter, Rosie. So you get kind of these, these shifts in tone, you get kind of these shifts in narrator that are that are very subtle but it's just like if you picked up an ancient work of literature and so it, it, he really I, I can't think of anyone else in literature who has accomplished something similar where it's like he, he wanted to yeah. write like the bible basically <laughs> yeah he, he succeeded what in something i don't know of a modern writer that has succeeded in which is he he set out in part to write sort of like an origin story of england yeah or, or Northern Europe, sort of like different cultures throughout history have had these epic narratives that are part of kind of their culture that kind of explain, if not the actual history of the, the country or the nation, at least the ethos, yeah. you know, the tradition, you know, where it came from, who we are as a people. And he was trying to write something kind of like that for Northern Europe, for, for England. This is, if, you know, in our, if we had an epic past, it would be something like yeah. this. And he succeeds because we all read it and we're like, yeah, this feels like my history. Yeah, you know, it, it is we It is bizarre a little bit in like our household. I'm sure this is true of other people's households. It's kind of like, I've got the Bible and I got a catechism and like Lord of the Rings is up there yeah, on the shelf like too. Right it's kind of to like it. yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> part of my, part of my history, part of my imbibed, absorbed history 
Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. In so in the Catholic Church, we have people that we recognize as saints that like have miracles attributed to them as like, we're, you know, we're, we're pretty sure these people are in heaven and we can ask for their prayers. And then there's, uh, I think, yeah. 27 what are called doctors of the church, people who throughout the church history have right. written good doctrine. So like Thomas Aquinas, Teresa of Avila, St. Augustine, these like big heavyweights of the intellectual tradition. And generally, those people are also saints. And I, I don't know much about Tolkien's personal life and his personal sanctity. So I don't know whether he would be a saint. But I totally think he could be a doctor of the church just in terms of his understanding of <laughs> like the, the way he co he's communicating grace, the way he communicates human nature, yeah. the way he communicates sin. Uh, I, I say that the, the, my, my two favorite uh, are artists when it comes to their understanding of the way sin operates within human nature and concupiscence, one is Tolkien and one is Taylor Swift. <laughs> and you notice I talk about them <laughs> all the time on this show. <laughs> It's like, you know, Boromir being tempted by the ring, Taylor Swift's illicit affairs. Like they just, ha they understand human nature and sweat and, and sin. Like, absolutely. So anyway, I was going to say about Tolkien, I, certainly he was a, a devout man, yeah. devout Catholic man, uh, remained so throughout his life. I think like any, I've never heard of a, of a cause being made out for his sainthood and like any potential saint, he'd be the first to, to, to say that the idea of him being declared a saint would be a bosh. Uh, yeah. He was he was sort of a crotchety soul, <laughs> and and that I, he probably still had some some refining to do before he went into heaven. Um, but a very devout man. I mean, one of the, I'd highly recommend it to those who haven't read it and are interested. Uh, reading there's a book of his letters between he and his son. Mm. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. His letters to all kinds of people, but many of them were between him and his sons, uh, and they're very insightful, very beautiful. A lot of the quotes that come out from Tolkien about the Eucharist. There's some beautiful quotes out there uh, and about other aspects of the faith come from those letters. Uh, so he remained a very devout man, very sincere, very earnest, and he was involved certainly in his good friend C.S. Lewis's uh, conversion to Christianity yeah. through their friendship, through Tolkien's sharing, even though you know Lewis never joined him in the Catholic Church. Uh, certainly his uh, coming to Christ was due to Tolkien's fidelity and his friendship. And so good man, devout man, whether or not he could be declared a saint, I yeah. think I'm well, quite confident that he's uh, <laughs> one of the church triumphs. Yeah, I could. I, I feel comfortable asking for his intercession. Um, and even Amen. in C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, like the main character, Ransom, like I think in some ways he's modeled after Tolkien. Like he's a philologist. Sure. He studies language much like Tolkien does. And um, anyway, so it's, it's, it's yeah. kind of funny that he's the great hero of that story based after his friend. So a couple other things yeah. I love artistically is uh, there's these narrative uh, shifts. Like it's broken into six books. Like each of the three books is broken into to, to two. So there's book one through six. And so you get um, Frodo and Sam like go off on their own at the at the end of their betrayal by Boromir and the orcs attack and then you don't hear about them for like another 200 pages because <laughs> then you're with Legolas and um mm -hmm. and, and Merry and Pippin and and Gandalf on on their their adventures and then at the end of the the two towers you get Frodo taken by Shelob and spoilers by the way for a book that's like you know, 80 years old. <laughs> so I don't, I don't feel bad throwing that out there. Um, but then you, again, you don't know what happened to Frodo for like another 200 pages. So it's just like, so crippling when you're, when you're reading it, it's like, Oh, I got, I got to find out what happened. Like, you don't know what happens to Gandalf in the movies. Like it shows Gandalf gets captured by Saruman. He's on top of Isengard, but in the book, it's just like, I was supposed to meet Gandalf and he never shows up. And here's this Strider guy. And I wonder where Gandalf is. And I wonder where Gandalf is. And you don't find out until a hundred pages later where Gandalf was all the time. Um, I love all the Catholic stuff. Like the Lemboss is kind of like the Eucharist in some ways. Galadriel definitely has like Marian, our lady, um, vibes, uh, the day that the ring is destroyed in Mount Doom is the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th. Um, and also it's the day when Sam's first child is born. Like, so, so there's all sorts of like little Catholic stuff just kind of like thrown in there, which I love. Um, lots of Macbeth references, like that, that whole idea of uh, no man born of woman can slay me. Like that's totally from Macbeth because uh, the guy who kills Macbeth uh, I think he was born by cesarean section or something like that. And that's how he's able to kill Macbeth, even though the witches told him no man could slay me. So the same thing with Eowyn being like, I am no man and she can kill the witch king. Um, and then when the, the, the uh, uh, supposedly Tolkien, when he was reading Macbeth and there's this prophecy from the witches that uh, Macbeth will be king until the forests go to war and the, the forests like march on his 
castle. And he's like, oh, well, that's never going to happen. And then in Macbeth, you know, Tolkien was expecting the forest to actually go to war. And what happens is the people just like disguise themselves and camouflage with a bunch of sticks. And he's like, that's lame. So then he invented the, that's lame. So he invented the Ents and had Fanghorn <laughs> Forest actually go to war because he's like, I want this to actually happen. So, so there's, there's, there's lots of so literature good. references, lots of uh, Christian and Catholic references. Um, and uh, yeah, so some things that maybe I, I think are, are hard for modern, modern audience, audiences is if you're reading it, the first hundred pages or 50 pages of Fellowship are a real slog to get through. Like it, in the movie, it's like five minutes, but in the book, it's like 30 years <laughs> between yeah. when Frodo gets the ring and when he leaves, like it's a long time. Uh, and also just like some of the descriptions of battle, you know, it'll be like, and Legolas's bow was singing, you know, and it like it, it's, it's a, it, written in a pre cinematic pre movie era. So you don't get, you know, when he notched a, an arrow to his bow and he let it fly and it hit the orc right in the forehead. Like you don't, you don't get those sort of specific battle descriptions you would get in a fantasy novel nowadays where they're thinking, you know, maybe someday this is going to be an Amazon show or this is going to be a movie. So I think those two things sometimes are difficult for modern audiences, but they're still, these books are totally worth reading. If you've only seen the movies, I highly recommend get a couple friends, do a book club, read all the way through them. It's, it's epic. So. So I want to speak to the first one of that, you know, difficulties reading a, a, a book that I would oddly recommend everybody read at some point in their life preferably early in their life because it'll help all later reading is a book by um, not Alistair McIntyre. I always get his name mixed up with the other guy. It, it, the book is how to read a book mm. and it's a famous book by a famous author that I can't remember. <laughs> right. Mortimer, Mortimer Adler. Okay, That's what it is. That, that guy. Um, it's a great book. Uh, surprisingly, it sounds like it would be really boring, but it's really useful. One of the things that he points out is there's, there's different ways of reading books. And if a book is worth reading, it's worth reading again and with that in mind, we should give ourselves permission, especially when we're reading books that are a bit harder, a bit deeper than we're perhaps used to. You should give yourself permission to skim the first time through mm. or run the first time through. I, I, with um, with nonfiction, I, I end up skimming a lot the first time I read through a book. With fiction, it's not so much that I skim. It's that I'm I'm following the plot the first time I read through. Right. Yeah. So the first time you read through a fiction book, you don't know where it's going. And there's a party that w wants to kind of like rush through the descriptions and just, and just follow the plot points. And some people feel bad about that and they try not to do that and then they get bogged down. And what my message to them would be, don't worry about the first time through uh, doing that, reading it perfectly. Yeah, just get through the plot, follow the plot points, rush through a little bit if, if you feel like it, follow the plot to the end uh, at, at whatever pace is most comfortable to you. Just get through yeah. it, okay? The second time you read it, because there should be a second time, because any great work of literature bears that second reading, that's when, well, hey, you already know where this is going. Now you can walk a little bit more leisurely through the work, and you'll discover a whole, a whole different side of the work that you didn't get the first time around. The first time you're focused on plot points and action, yeah. second time or third time, that you're able to, to, to uh, sink a bit more deeply into the descriptions, the locations, the, character, the, the subplots, the character arcs. Uh, so don't get bogged down the first time. Just get through it uh, at a breakneck pace if, if, if need be. And then uh, in future readings, maybe the second time, if you listen to it, the audio book, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, then you can sink more deeply into the description. Well, speaking of getting bogged downs in the themes, are you ready to get bogged down in the spiritual themes? <laughs> Let's get bogged down. In Let's the get bogged themes. down in the spiritual themes. The, all right, we're going going through the dead marshes, being bogged down. <laughs> That's oh, uh, so. The first thing I wanted to talk about. Don't look at the lights. <laughs> Don't look at the lights. We're going in circles, <laughs> Sam. We've been here before. Uh, my. <laughs> My, my, I said before that Tolkien and Taylor Swift are my patron saints of, of understanding human nature <laughs> and uh, the way sin <laughs> operates in the human soul. And so I wanted to yeah. uh, talk about the ring. And the ring, uh, it comes from an ancient – it comes from Plato's Republic. There's, a, there's this Greek – this idea of an, a ring that turns you invisible but mm -hmm. also corrupts your soul. There's this ancient Greek myth. And in book two of Plato's Republic, Plato talks about it when he's discussing justice. Um, actually, the guy he's debating with talks about it. And um, – so basically this ring, the ring of Gyges, it, it turns him invisible. He, he discovers this ring in like this ancient king's um, coffin. And then it allows him to basically murder the king, seduce his wife, become lord of all the realm. And the guy that Plato is discussing this with basically is using this as, as evidence that people are always trying to do what's 
evil because if you have no consequences because you have an invisible ring, you would always do what's evil. And that's actually the best life. The best life is to be unjust and to try to do the worst things you can and, and then get everything for yourself and just exploit and manipulate people. And that's actually the best life. And then Plato has to argue that no, justice is something that's worth doing in the good life and the virtuous life is something worth doing for its own sake, not just because it happens to, to get you some good things like really you should be just even if you had this invisible ring i mean there's actually some like there's some if you ever read book two of the of the of plato's republic there's actually like this really cool reference to christ even though it's written in a non-pagan it's written in a non-christian pagan culture like 300 years before christ it like talks about a guy being like pierced and rejected even though he was like the perfect innocent man it's like anyway really beautiful so tolkien takes that Boom. story of the <laughs> ring and he makes this yeah. ring of power which corrupt it turns you invisible but it also corrupts you and so every person who encounters the ring has this test they're tested um am i going to become great am i going to lord my power over people and we get uh what is often called in, in, in Tolkien discussions, ring induced monologues, where these people go into monologues induced by the ring. And the most famous is Boromir. I'm going to re read a little bit of it here. Yeah. And just notice that this is the exact same way that whatever sin it is you're struggling with, this is how it starts. So uh, Boromir is trying to convince Frodo to take the ring with him to Minas Tirith, the great city of Gondor, so they can attack uh, Mordor straight on and protect the ring in this great city. Um, and, uh, he says, well, we sh even if we fall, we shall fall in battle valiantly. Yet there is still hope that we will not fail in Minas Tirith. And Frodo says, there's no hope while the ring lasts. And he goes, oh, the ring, the ring. It's not such a, isn't it so weird we have this ring? He's like, oh yeah, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the ring. It's like, I wasn't even thinking about that. And, he's, and Frodo's like, let's not talk about the ring. He's like, well, I can't even talk about it. And, and so it, that's how sin starts. It's like, oh, oh yeah, that's sin. I wasn't really thinking about that. Well, I, I can think about it. I can... I can at least think about that thing. You know, let's just entertain this idea. And uh, then he's like, oh, we can, we can use it. Like other people would be tempted by this to use it in a bad way. But, you know, I'm a strong guy. I wouldn't be tempted. Maybe these wizards would be tempted, but I'm a noble man of Gondor and I wouldn't be tempted. And by the end, he's just like yelling, screaming at Frodo, trying to steal it from him. Um, and so we get uh, – monologue after monologue like this i want to uh show just a, a couple more galadriel has the famous one from the movie where she's like you would have a dark queen and all would love me in despair i love golems the most he says um see my precious if we has it then we can escape even from him meaning sauron perhaps we grow very strong that stronger than the wraiths lord smeagol golem the great the golem eat fish every day three times a day fresh fish from the sea most precious golem must have it we wants it we wants it we wants it like his his great <laughs> dream is to like be powerful and so he can eat a lot of fish and then um yeah. Sam's it says when when Sam is tempted by the ring it says already the ring tempted him gnawing at his will and reason wild fantasies arose in his mind he saw himself Samwise the strong hero of the age striding with a flaming sword across the darkened land of Mordor armies flocking to his call as he marched to overthrow uh, the dark lord um, and then I'll skip a bit uh, but basically his <laughs> because he's a gardener like that's his job he was Frodo's gardener and that's like how he's eavesdropping on Gandalf and Frodo's conversations at the beginning is because he's like working in the garden um he basically wants to turn mordor into a garden like that's his that's his dream is it says uh, a garden swollen to an entire realm and so it's interesting the way that sin operates on each person and like takes the thing that they love and kind of inflates it with this pr with this pride and saying uh, you like fish well you could be lord of the fish you could have all the fish you want right you want to protect minas tirith well what better way to protect gondor than to take over everything oh you you want to be uh, beautiful and have a beautiful realm elf queen because you love the forest well what if you were you know this beautiful enchantress who would <laughs> cover the world you know you love gardening what if your garden covered everything so and i think that's just totally indicative of the way that sin can take a good thing and it can it can twist it and it can take over your life and make it into something that's miserable yeah and it always does take over a good thing again so we go back to the greeks and aquinas here that every every person is always aiming at happiness in every action yes. good or evil uh, at their core, they're aiming at ha happiness, right? They want some good. That's what some go real or perceived good is what they're aiming at. Uh, the question is how they get there, you know. And from the beginning, you know, in all the 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 origin stories of uh, of even our faith, in terms of uh, Satan's fall and then uh, Adam and Eve's fall in the garden, it always comes down to this question of I, I want something good, but will I receive it from God? 
or take it for myself. Yes. <clears throat> right? The, uh, so we have we have in, in Lucifer and Satan we have this I will not serve right he, he, rather than receiving uh, his goodness from God his his being you know being the highest of the angels uh, he won't serve he he wants he wants to reject that reality to to hold on to his own uh, autonomy his own you know self will to power and in the garden too we have this temptation. Uh, not to bad things, right? It's it's t- temptation to knowledge. It's a temptation to being like God. Yeah. It's, it's temptation to kind of growing up and all, uh, you know, being able to being taken care of. All good things. All things that God was going to give them was giving them. Yeah. Uh, but the temptation was to to grasp, to nullify reality, and to grasp at this good in a way that was illicit. Yeah. And so again, I think that all those examples you you gave, right? They're all people who, in their mind's eye, they have some good. But the temptation isn't to the good; it's to the way of of grasping at the good, uh, and and the ring always rese- represents um, this uh, this going at the good the wrong way, you know, taking a shortcut. I, I've actually uh, we ha- this is a personal theory of mine, but it, it seems to me often that the ring, if it's a metaphor for anything specific, obviously it's a general metaphor for just sin. But if it's a metaphor for anything more specific, it seems to me to often to be a metaphor for lying, mm. right? That if if I could just if I could just uh, obfuscate reality a little bit, I'd be able to get this good. I'd be able to win this battle. I'd be able to have what I want if I can just embrace the deception. If I can just hide from the reality, we have the you know the, the ring makes you invisible. Yeah. If I can just hide from reality or hide some reality, I'll be able to bring about this good. Uh, but you can't. You can't pursue good by nullifying reality. You have to live in reality. That's just part of being a virtuous person. You have to be a person who lives in reality. Well, and the way that the ring works, like it's kind of it's kind of mysterious, the magic of Lord of the Rings. Like you're never exactly sure what Gandalf yeah. can do, what Sauron can do. You never even right. really see Sauron in the books at all. You just see his, mm-hmm. his effects. And the ring is kind of like that. It's like, it turns you invisible, but like, what else does the ring do? Like, how would the ring let Boromir lead armies? How would it let Gandalf become this mm-hmm. this terrible wizard? How would it let Galadriel become this this great elf queen? And what the ring does when you read the Lord of the Rings, pay attention to the will. Anytime it mentions someone's will, anytime it mentions choice, what the ring does is it corrupts your will and allow you to dominate the will of others. And if you think about what were the great evils of the time when Tolkien was growing up, and writing is people were deceived as you were saying this deception these lives into these lies into going to war like he convinced all of europe to just kill each other in world war one you, you know hitler convinced in the entire german people to exterminate jews <laughs> convince you know the 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 japanese were able to convince their you know all their warriors to you know to to fight till the very end even if surrender was uh impossible or even even if even if victory was impossible to never surrender you know kamika- how, how, what does it take to convince someone to fly a kamikaze jet knowing you're going to die knowing that your country is going to fall anyway like what does it take to dominate the wills of other people and so that's in the back of tolkien's mind and it's something that we should think about in terms of the way we manipulate other people, the way we allow other people to manip- manipulate us through the lies and through the deception. So I just think it's a really cool lens to be able to see the way that we affect one another with yeah. our own lies and deception. Lord of the Rings is, a, is an interesting work to consider that question that you brought up at the beginning there of the different kinds of magic that show up in, yeah. in works of literature and comparing those to the real world. Because sometimes the question, you know, is, is put to people like, well, okay, what's the difference between this, you know, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings or, or magic in the real world and Lord of the Rings? Or what's the difference between, you know, the magic that the good guys use versus the magic that the bad guys yeah. use? Like, what's what's the big distinction here? And there's a couple of distinctions. Number, I think one of the things that we see in Lord of the Rings is there's a big distinction between powers that are received from your creator, right? Yeah. That are, that are yours by your nature of your creator and those that are seized or taken, mm-hmm. right? So that's, that's one level. There's, there's uh, even, so even in this fairy tale that we live in, Mike, right? We have powers, yeah. we have our mind, we have free will, we have bodies, all those come along with powers that are, have been given to us. That's one level. Is a power given and, and, and uh, licitly yours to wield yeah. or is it not? Right. Uh, in our world, right, I've, I've had to explain this to my kids many times. In our world, the only time you encounter witchcraft and wizardry is people who are, are attempting <laughs> through, through devils and demons or, or sources they do not know 
to get power that is not theirs. Mm. And it only comes to them through something really nefarious. Yeah. That's the way it happens in our world. Maybe it's different in the world of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. In our world, that's just how it works. Yeah. So there's the level of, of power that is given by your nature through your creator. That's one level. And then the next level is then even with power that's illicitly yours, mm -hmm. what do you do with it? What is your purpose for it? And there's a connection. Uh, Tolkien was sensitive to this, and you can see it in the Enlightenment and afterwards, that there's a connection actually between people in our world who pursue magic, mm. who pursue you know witchcraft and stuff like that, and actually the impulse of a modern technological uh, domination of the world where they're both... Um, Technology is a is a use of illicit power, mm -hmm. a power of our imagination, power of technology, power of science, and all that. But it's it's used often in this impulse to overly try to control yeah. the world, to control other people, to control circumstances. And in that sense, it, it gets connected to magic. In the sense, they're both have this impulse to dominate and control in a way that goes beyond what you were put on this earth to do, yeah. what you're called to in your nature, your teleology, your teleology, your purpose. Uh, there's a connection between those types of power. So in Lord of the Rings, right, we have all those examples. We have power that is given versus power that is taken and seized. That's not yours. Mm -hmm. And then we have example of power that's licitly yours, like the wizards, right, used either in, in accordance with their mission and purpose mm -hmm. versus in accordance with their own their yeah, own Yeah, Gandalf versus Sauron. Yeah, a couple things you said there. The, exactly. the way that the person receives the ring is very important. Like Isildur cut the ring yeah. from uh, Sauron's hand, and it very quickly right. corrupted him whereas frodo like bilbo found the ring uh smeagol right. killed his brother deagle to get the ring frodo receives mm -hmm. the ring as a gift from bilbo um and so th right. the idea that either when the ring is given or when it's taken and uh at the end the way the ring is ultimately destroyed like frodo's will fails in the final effort like he's there at mount doom and he decides not to throw it in and what actually right. wins the day is Gollum trying to take the ring and bites it off his finger, off Frodo's finger, and then he falls into the pit. But why is Gollum there in the first place? Because months before, Frodo had decided to have mercy on Gollum and decided not to kill him. Yeah. And there's that whole, all that whole speech where um, Frodo says to Gandalf, I wish Bilbo had just killed him. And Gandalf says something like, you know, there are many who deserve life who don't get it and there are many who deserve death that don't get it can you give it to them frodo and my heart tells me that Gollum still has some part to play and even though Gollum is yeah. never really redeemed because of frodo's act of mercy that ends right. up winning the day and this gets into the idea of of, of providence and um it, this is this is yeah. from the um the silmarillion and the silmarillion which is uh like the, the stories of the elves. It's like the Bible for the Lord of the Rings. There's this creation myth where God, who is called Il Iluvatar, he starts creation by singing and he sings into creation all the all these angelic beings, one of whom is Melkor, who's the original Dark Lord. And everyone is, they're all singing, but Melkor starts singing out of tune. And it says, it says Melkor raises a strong, violent counter melody. So Iluvatar creates a soft new theme to envelop it. And as Melkor's music essayed to drown out Iluvatar's music by the violence of its voice, but it seemed that, it, that its most triumphant notes were taken by Iluvatar's theme and woven into its own solemn pattern. So even though Melkor is trying his best <laughs> to distort what God is yeah. doing, God's just able to change the theme a little bit and take those crooked lines and write straight with them. He's able to take right. this, this deception of Gollum and the failure of Frodo's yeah will and he's still able to work it for the good and it reminds me of romans 8 where it says god works all things for the good of those who love him according to his purpose this idea of god's right. providence that even when we're screwing up even when we're sinning like god is still in control and that doesn't mean we're not responsible it doesn't mean we don't have consequences for our actions but when we turn everything over to god when we repent when we throw even our sins at his feet god can bring glory even from our sins even from the cross even from jesus dying on the cross yeah. god can work amazing beautiful things from that and that is just totally all throughout the lord of the rings god taking these things yeah. that seem awful and then working them for the good um tolkien had a, a term called the you catastrophe meaning a, a good catastrophe yeah. and so like when the rohirrim come through to save the day at the battle of the pelinor fields or when the eagles come at the end some people kind of criticize that as you know that's kind of that's kind of cheap story writing like somebody just comes in at the end and saves the day but tolkien say no that's how god works is like just when things seem right. their darkest like god comes through and sometimes even uses the instrument of evil and subverts it and uses it for the good. And that's, I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, the whole, the whole uh, theme of free will and providence is perhaps one of the most important themes that's, that runs throughout, as you talked about. Uh, and it is one of those themes that it resonates so much because it, it is precisely how our world works. Like we're, we're, dis we're rediscovering in there the reality of our own world. Um, we think about, you know, God's will. Sometimes we, when we're trying to discern, right, we think about God's will. And sometimes we, we wrongly, well, we think about it in terms of like, well, there's a million things I could do. Lord, which one do you want me to do, right? Uh, and so sometimes it seems like we have a, a many options in front of us. But in the end, it's interesting to think we, we, it comes down to, to actually two, right? At any given moment, you are either trying sincerely to simply do what is right in front of you or you're not for a thousand different reasons, for f fear or desire or, you know, you're hesitant or whatever. But you're either trying sincerely to do the right thing in front of you or you're not. And the thing is, again, if we think about it, we the reality of a provident, good, loving God who knows where this is all going has seen, you know, foresees all of it and yet we're free. There's a comfort for the Christian knowing that if I simply am faithful in this decision, I, I don't see where it will go, but I know that I'm stepping into God's will when I simply try in this moment to do what is right. Mm. And that God's will will be done in the end. You know, again, from my perspective, there's, there, it seems like there's many options. There's actually only two. From God's perspective, there's only one because he already knows where this story is going, mm. right? The question is whether it will happen through you or in spite of you. Ooh, okay. Because God's will will be done. Yeah. Like the story will happen. The catastrophe will occur. The question is whether you'll be part of it uh, what, <laughs> voluntarily what side? because you're yeah. with God. Uh -huh. What side are you going to be <laughs> Or on? whether it'll happen It'll happen despite, you know, what you were trying to do. Yeah, it reminds me of... And so, again, whenever... Okay, ahead, I was man. just going to say, it reminds me of C.S. Lewis famously said at the end of the day, uh, yeah. either you say to God, God, thy will be done, or God says to you, fine, thy will be done. And God lets us be miserable by refusing his mercy. And that's that's what hell is. Like, that's... God right. lets us be on the other side if if we if we choose. So yeah, yeah, but 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 he still wins. He still like wins. The, the story yeah. remains the same. Uh -huh. His glory uh, is not diminished in this mysterious yeah. way. Mm -hmm. And so when we find ourselves like with Frodo at these at these spots, and we all meet them, this is another thing that we have to keep in mind as Christians in in our world. Gosh, we're not ready for those moments when um, when we have to be faithful. Like I, you see Christian politicians all the time, right? They got in politics, and somehow they're surprised when oh. Suddenly, I reached this decision point where either I have to be faithful or successful. Yeah. And the idea that you were surprised that you would get to that point where you had to make a choice is is ridiculous. Yep. Like that—that that is the nature of being in this world. That you're going to get to a point, whether you're a businessman or a lawyer or a politician or whatever you are, on the big things or the small things, you'll get to these points where the question is: Will I remain faithful? And, and step forward somewhat blindly. Like, I don't know where this is going. It doesn't look like it's going in a good direction, but I need to remain faithful and honest and true in this moment. Or I divert from the path and I try to take things into my own hands. Mm -hmm. Those are the two options. Yeah. And the thing is, if we if we stay faithful, what we're doing is we're stepping into God's will and we're, and then we await the eucatastrophe. We wait for the moment where we see the fruit come out. We see how he was all working together for good for those who love God. Yes, amen, amen, amen. Yeah, it's a fundamental. It's a fundamental act of faith, right? Like that's what it comes down to. You can say that you believe in God. You can act it out the part, whatever. But it comes down when you're actual faced with the decision, even the smallest decisions. I mean, this is the thing. It's the smallest decisions, whether you know the, on the day to day level, whether you're going to be faithful in the little things. It comes down to: Do I really believe God is the Lord? Yeah. Do I believe He's provident? Do I believe He's in control? Because if He is who He says He is, who I say He is in the creed then there's nothing for it but to remain faithful in the small thing and trust that he is working this story. Whew, man, I, need, I needed this little sermon today, John Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a, it's been a tough summer and I, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I trust God, but do I trust God right now in like what's going, going on right now? Um, that's a lot harder. And, uh, yeah, I needed, yeah. I needed to hear that. Whew. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a kick in the, kick in the soul right there. <laughs> so speaking, speaking of friendships that challenge us, I want to talk about the beautiful mm. friendships in this story and the beautiful model of what it means to be a Christian 
man. I, I know for many young men, we've talked about this a lot on the show, especially on our, our recent show on, on Blink-182 with uh, Anthony D'Ambrosio. We talked a lot about um, what it means to be a man and are the rites of passage that help us to be men nowadays. We don't really know what it means to be a good man nowadays. And I think Lord of the Rings for me has been really formational for helping me realize like what sort of man I want to be because so much of the culture is just like one man on a mission and he doesn't need anybody but the ladies all want him and he's really sexy and awesome you know and that's what it means to be a man you know and he he can get mad but he can't get sad and you know like those those are kind of the images of macho manliness that we get and the men in or or the opposite or the complete or the nowadays the the complete negation oh yeah the complete complete there's because there's a reaction against that and there should be a reaction against that but we also need a yeah we should but we we also just you just can't just be like a a, a nice guy, you know, you need to be a, a, a strong man, but, a, but a generous man as a, a you know, a, as C.S. Lewis says of Aslan the lion, like he's dangerous, but he's good. <laughs> you know, he's not safe, but he's right. good. And I, what I see yeah. in the men in Lord of the Rings, like Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, like, yeah, they are awesome warriors and they can cut the heads off orcs and shoot an arrow through an orc's eye at a hundred yards. And they are awesome. But like Aragorn is like constantly kissing everybody. Like he kisses Boromir, he kisses Frodo. Like he's always, he's very affectionate. He he's like, he really at his heart, he's a healer and he's singing these like great elf songs. And like he and Bilbo talk about like the finer points of elf poetry. And you know, he wears flowers in his hair and like Legolas and Gimli at the end of the Lord of the Rings What do they do? They go on this tour of Middle Earth where like Legolas shows Gimli all the beautiful forests of Middle Earth and then Gimli shows Legolas all the beautiful caves of Middle Earth. It's like (laughs) they appreciate art and beauty and natural wonder and they're very affectionate and they're constantly talking about how they love each other and like Sam and Frodo, like the tenderness of their friendship and again, they're always like hugging and kissing each other and like there's, there's just this great tenderness and this robust vision of what it means to be a Christian man who is strong and is tender. And it, you know, it reminds me of Jesus is who it reminds me of. And it's, it's the sort of, it's been very consoling to me when I have struggled to know who am I as a man? Am I a man? Am I a good man? Am, you know, it, and reading Lord of the Rings reminds me of the sort of man I want to be. I want to be a man like Sam, like Frodo, like Aragorn, yeah. like Gimli, like Legolas, you know? Um, right. So, so, uh, a few things there. So on masculinity and femininity, like there's a lot of concern and worry and arguing in the modern world about, you know, what it is to be a man and woman. And even amongst Christian circles, sometimes we we're wondering about those images. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the crazy macho man. It's also not the milk toast, milk sop, you know, yeah. you know, but what is it? But one of the keys is that you don't masculinity and femininity are attained by the man or woman who are pursuing virtue, not pursuing images of masculinity and femininity. Ooh, okay. So in Lord of the Rings, right, you find these epic men that you want to emulate, not because they're out there thinking hard about, well, how, what does it look like to be a man? And how do I be a man? Like, they're not thinking those questions. They're thinking about what do I need to do? How do I take care of my friends? What, the, what mission am I called on? And it's in fulfilling your mission. It's in pursuing virtue. It's in becoming virtuous that a man exudes true masculinity, a woman true femininity. It comes about through virtue, not through images or putting on... Uh, things you still there, Mike? Yeah, just I'm here. Sure you just the... you just blew my okay, mind. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. You just okay, blew so my that, mind. That's with that. one. That's thing. awesome. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so and then number two is that um, in a particular interesting way in Lord of the Rings too, we also have um, these archetypes of who uh, every Christian is called to, uh, and then and men in a particular way. Like um, every Christian is priest, prophet, and king by virtue of their baptist they're called to those roles uh, and again men in a particular way that's a slightly different but to christians in, in general you know the king every one of us is called in a in the kingly role like aragorn to be to to lead others like we all have people that we are called to uh to be an example for to lead to build them up to bear them up to heal that is this kingly role that again everyone's called to yeah um Husbands are called to in a particular way within their family, but every person is called to in in the particular realm that they yeah. that they are called a cer- to. By a the certain nature. authority this, and a certain calling. Yeah, mm-hmm. everyone everyone is there. everyone is is in the hierarchy. We all have people to look up to, you know, and God's at the, at the top of that ladder. Yeah. And we all have people that God has given to us to take care of. So we all stand in a kingly role. Um, it's at some place in our life. 
Um, we also have, so that's that's Aragorn. We also have the priestly role. That is the person who sacrifices to bring heaven and earth together. And of course, we have that in a particular way in Frodo. Like he is the one who says, "I'll do it. I'll accept the sacrifice to bring about this change, to bring about this healing." Uh, I'll accept the the death and resurrection, mm. and then of course we have the prophetic role in uh, in Gandalf. We have the person who is called by God to speak truth to those around him, mm. to be this bearer of truth and goodness and beauty to others. And so there we have these artistic archetypes that are not specifically about manhood, but certainly about the kind you know the the archetypes that inform uh, who like what what the the true man or woman really looks like when they're, when they're entering their roles, these things kind of emerge. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought about the, the priest prophet and King role specifically in regards to these characters. I was thinking specifically about Gandalf, like the power of his voice and, um, and also yeah. Saruman, uh, they talk about the power of his voice and he's a corrupted wizard, you know, and, and the, especially when Gandalf and Sauron are talking back and forth and it talks about the way the rest of the crowd reacts at uh, Isengard. It's like Sauron's talking and yeah. it's like, all right, he's starting to win over the crowd. And then Gandalf talks that it's like a frost got thawed out all of a sudden, like a fresh wind came through. Right. And Gandalf does the same They're... thing with Theoden with Wormtongue there. And he's just like in the, in the movies, it's like he casts a spell and uh, like he, he yeah. does this magic spell and it opens up the windows. But in the book, he's just like, he gets them to stand up and he walks outside in the sun and there's like a breeze and he like puts his hand on his sword and it's like that's what breaks mm. the spell it's just this 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 voice that got him to finally like stop living in his cave and like you know in his own like dark depression like got him to actually go out and right. and, and and see the needs of the world and remember his strength you know um i love that and that prophetic role is so important again that we we are all called at some places in our life to be that voice that authoritative voice calling people back sometimes sometimes we're we're talking to ourselves in the mirror calling ourselves back from sloth or from from uh, sin but certainly again with this theme of friendship that's part of like, again, we stand in those roles within our friendships, within our relationships, that we are, we're, when we're in a friendship, we're mutually leading, we're self-sacrificing, we're also calling each other to greatness. Um, and all, you know, with Tolkien and Lewis too, we have this, this theme of friendship, this image of friendship as being shoulder to shoulder. That was something that Lewis emphasized in his Four Loves, right? That friendship love is this, this love that is primarily characterized by being shoulder to shoulder toward a common goal. Mm. Uh, and that's where we we have such these beautiful friendships emerge in Lord of the Rings is that we have people who are working together towards some good. And that's where this particular kind of love, this friendship love is particularly seen. And so if we don't, if we're not having it nowadays, sometimes that question is asked, like, what, why don't we have friendships like we see imaged here? Mm -hmm. And these are not merely fantasy. These are, these are perhaps friendship the way it was perhaps before the modern world. Mm -hmm. We certainly have throughout historical uh, works and through literature, we have images of friendship that seem very distant from us nowadays. Yeah. Like we feel like we're, we've lost something. I think that's part of it is that we're, we are people who now feel like we're without a purpose, without, without a cause, without a mission, without a quest. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. We as Christians know the quest that we're on. If you're a husband, if you're a father, uh, if you're a Christian, you have already, you have, you have quests given to you. You have high, great things you're called to do. The question is, are you finding other people who uh, you know? Who also recognize those quests, and are you going shoulder to shoulder with them and getting stuff done? Wow! Because that's where this great friendship blossoms out of. So what what that makes me think of is is the the power of that friendship. Because uh, one one of the great ridiculous things of the Lord of the Rings is, uh, you know, the the elf that saves Frodo from the Ring Wraiths in the movie is Arwen, who eventually becomes Aragorn's wife. But in the book, right. it's this elf warrior Glorfindel who's like killed balrogs and like come back from the dead and like when when uh, frodo has the ring on and he sees glorfindel it just looks like this great shining thing like he's he's like a hev he's like almost an angel he is like the most hardcore elf left in middle earth and he's there at the council of elrond and he doesn't go with them because that's not the sort of person that can do this mission who can do this mission a little humble hobbit and his even humbler hobbit buddy and the power of their friendship to be together yeah. and have that tenderness and support for each other is more powerful than Glorfindel, the badass elf who kills Balrogs. Like that is the real power is the power of that friendship. And that's why these stories speak to me. Like how much less powerful would this story be if they sent Glorfindel on an Eagle to go like, 
charge in and strike down the ring wraiths. Like he did it once in, 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 uh, Rivendell. Why can't he just kill the ring wraiths again, flying into, uh, into Mordor? But that's, that's not the power of the story. The power of the story is this tender friendship between these two kind of little weak guys who are able to take the worst evil that the world can throw at them because of the power of their devotion to each other and the power of their devotion to this cause to not give up even when it seems like it's totally dark. And there, there's this beautiful image when they're camping on the, the with Smeagol and they're thinking Smeagol's going to kill them in their sleep and they're on the mountains of Mordor and Sam just catches this glimpse of this elf star through the clouds because there's the Mount Doom is belching out this huge uh, plume of smoke to cover the land in darkness so the orcs can march during the day and like the whole land for miles around is dark. But just poking through the clouds is this one elf star and they can hold on to that one little glimmer of hope in, in, in days and months of darkness because of the power of their friendship that carries them through. And it's just like, I don't know, I, I love that. It speaks to my heart deeply. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, again, it gets to another theme to um, this, like why thematically, why are the hobbits and why is the little guy, the underdog, why is he so necessary, you know, for the victory? Right. And part of what's going on in the story, right, is this, uh, these axes, these dynamics between uh, pride and humility, uh, sloth and despair and magnanimity. We have in the spiritual life, this uh, apparent paradox where um, we're called to great things, but pride, uh, well, I mean, think, think about pride and humility for a moment. When we think about humility, right, we normally wrongly think of the person who just is sort of like wimpy and, and it doesn't have much ambition and just kind of like lets the world roll over him. Whereas pride is this image of a person who thinks greatly of themselves and they want all the world and they're, we have to dig into that a little bit more because pride and actually, it's I think it's it's close uh, brother uh, sloth and despair. They're both rejections of reality. Mm. And again, we, as we talked about in the beginning, the, I think the ring, among other things, is a good um, a metaphor for a rejection of reality, a hiding from reality, an obfuscation of reality, a lie. Mm. Right? Pride and despair, which are both th things we observe in many characters in Lord of the Rings. Throughout Lord of the Rings, we have many characters wrestling with both pride and despair. You think of Sauron and Saruman and Boromir and, and the steward and all that. Um, they're both rejections of reality. Like pride is looking down on God's reality and saying, no, no, I'll do it my own way. Despair is kind of looking up at it and saying, no, 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 I don't, that's too great for me. I, I can't handle that, whatever. They're both avoiding reality. Whereas humility primarily is not about, as Lewis said, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Mm. It's, it's, it's getting, it's not stopping thinking about yourself and it's focusing again on what is real. Who is God? Who am I? And what am I called to do? And the, 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 the paradox, apparent paradox, because there's no real paradox there, is that it's only the humble person who can have the holy ambition, this magnanimity, this upward desire for greatness in this pure sense. And so what we have in the hobbits, right? Uh, we, we have the great and the wise in, in Middle Earth who uh, other people recognize in them and some of them recognize in themselves that they are actually in great danger from the ring because yeah. they are tempted to pride. And, and when their pride is frustrated, they're tempted to despair, right? Yeah. Like we have these characters are always, you know, like we have the, the steward, right? Getting ready to burn Faramir oh, yeah. himself Denethor, because he's, just, yeah. he's given up hope, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the antidote to both pride and despair is humility. And so it's actually in the humble hobbits that there's this fertile ground for a pure, holy magnanimity. Uh, it, accepting a call to greatness, not one that they were out looking for, but when it came to them, they were able to say yes to it. And so they set out not as people of pride, people who were seeking greatness for themselves, but people who they, they received a call and they answered it yes. And so that's a model for us, right? Like we, our, our humility is to recognize the truth of who God is and who we are so that not that we can just like sit around and say, okay, that the big things are for other people to take care of. No, it's for you to be ready to receive your call and to do it, to go out on that mission. To, and, and what happens to them? What happens to the hobbits? When they get back to the Shire, they're like these princes. Yeah, they're like celebrities. these different yeah. guys. They're, 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 even the way they carry themselves, they've been mm -hmm. transformed 
transformed by their journey. Yeah. Pippen, That's what we're called to. Mary and Pippin are physically <laughs> like a foot taller because they, they drank the Ent draft. <laughs> right. the, Ent, the Ent draft. And uh, yeah, and what does Aragorn say right. to Frodo and Sam? He's like, you bow to no one, my friends. Like when they bow before the king, he's like, right. you don't bow to right. anybody. You know, they, yeah, so a- absolutely. Right. Right. And that's, that's I mean, in scripture again, like don't take, don't take the highest place at the table because you're going to be sent down yeah. to, the, to the, to the lowest place again. No, you take the lowest place in humility. You accept, you accept your state and then you wait to be called up higher. And that's what happens. We have the king at the end of Lord of the Rings yeah. saying, you bow to no one. Yeah. He who humbles yeah. himself will be exalted. It's very Franciscan, like St. Exactly. Francis. He, he named totally. his friars the Friars Minor, the Little Brothers. Not, not the great right. order of preachers, you know, not, not, yeah. not the great society of Jesus, but the, the Little Brothers. Um, but, but it's important to keep, again, both those, the humility and the magnanimity. Yeah, if, so, we're, if we're truly pursuing humility in God, he does call us to great things. Yeah, yeah. So magnanimity, if you're not familiar with that SAT word, it's one of John Mark's favorites. And my, my favorite episode of your show, John Mark, Elevate Ordinary, <laughs> is the one you did on magnanimity, uh, being magnanimous, oh. having this great soul. It was a, it was a big help great. to me yeah. because I'm the sort of person that loves kind of being the life of the party and goes in and gets everybody's attention and tries to be a good host. And mm-hmm. and so like humility has often been a struggle for me because it's, it's just very mm-hmm. against my nature to not want to like go in and you know, be the, be the most energetic person in the room, (laughs) you know? And so that, that was really helpful for me. Um, so if you're looking for help with that listeners, go listen to elevate ordinary, the episode on magnanimity being a great soul. It's one of the great virtues and, uh, yeah, it was helpful for me. So I bet it will be for you too. Um, one of the, uh, so we're, we're, we're close to the end here, but something I wanted to talk about is there's this ongoing theme throughout Lord of the Rings of this dynamic between the gardener and the healer, Mm and the warrior. So in everyone, especially if you watch the movie is like, of course the warriors get all the attention. Um, but Sam is the gardener, you know, and he eventually does get his, his, his inmost desire of like the, the garden swollen to a realm because he takes home some of the, um, soil from Lothlorien that was given to him by, uh, Galadriel and he plants it all over the Shire. And so the Shire does become like his entire garden, you know, and it becomes like the most beautiful place in, in middle earth. So he, he does get that. Um, but then what does Aragorn do? Yes, he's this great warrior, but at the end, he's known because he's a healer and that's what he wants to do. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what, um, and what do Faramir and Eowyn do? Eowyn wants to, to have glory by being a warrior. And when she meets Faramir, I'm a total Faramir stan, by the way, he gets, he gets not, not any good treatment in the movies, but he's like awesome in the books. So good. And he yeah, and Eowyn, the they move to, um, oh, what's, what's the garden like place on the edge of Mordor and, um, Athelion, I think it's the, the Mordor, the between Mordor mm. and Gondor, there's this garden where a hidden place. Yeah, where Sam and Frodo meet Faramir. It's this beautiful land. Yeah. And that's where that's where he becomes like the prince of, and they turn it into this beautiful garden and this place of healing. And that's so what, what Eowyn and Faramir end up doing at the end. So mm. uh, I really love that. So um, you need the, the most noble thing is to be a healer and a gardener, but the Shire is full of gardeners and the reason they can't defend themselves is because they have no warriors. So you need the warrior, you need the healer, you need the gardener. And, um, Faramir has this great line about like, I, I love not the warrior for his, like the strength of his steel or the swiftness of his bow or something like that, but just kind of mm-hmm. un- understanding that there's, there's this tension, there's this kind of triple Venn diagram where, where we need all three, the gardener, the healer and the yeah. warrior. And I, again, I think that, um, for me, think about the sort of virtuous person that I'm trying to be, the sort of kind of great soul, magnanimous person that I'm trying to be, is I, I want to be a, a gardener who can cultivate these places of peace, you know, in my own home, in my own world, even in my little corner of the internet with pop culture catechism. You know, I want to be a voice of healing yeah. who can heal people with the love of Christ. And yeah, I want to be a warrior who, who fights against evil. And, and so, um, but not, none of those can dominate. All of those have their place and all of those are, yeah. are part of the call. So, yeah. Yeah, the gardener that was our original call, right? And, yeah. and we don't, we can't think of that in a in too um, like in the book of Genesis, of you mean? A, of a sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, human beings, we were called to work with God to create something beautiful. You know, to to take to work again. Uh, an artist does the same thing, right? You, an artist, uh, listens to the muse and creates and discovers at the same time. You're always working with God. Right, you can't create out of nothing. That's God's yeah. territory is creating out of nothing. We always create within limits. We create, we turn, we make something into something else. We're always working with God, um, but we're working with God to bring about beauty, to bring about new life. Uh, so that was our. Uh, uh, that's an original vocation of ours. Now it's because of the fallen world that we actually have 
in, in the in this new human sense we have we have to be healers we have to be warriors yeah, right because there's now true. evil to fight there's now wounds to bind up so yes. that's part of this mission that we are on you know we are warriors and he he heroes by virtue of the kind of mission that we're on the kind of fairy tale that we're in but you know it, it reminds me a little bit of the of how we have to live this balance in our christian life in, in our human life between the sabbath and the rest of the week mm. right it's because of our condition that we have to have this distinction between the work and then the leisure, right? Before the fall, you didn't have to have that distinction in the same way because it all flowed into one another. Your work would have been your worship. Like you would have all been together. It's after the fall that we have this jarring division where we, we have to work to, to keep our life, but then God commands us, but don't let that work overtake the contemplation, the the, the relationship, the, the time with God. And part of the, the journey of our lives is bringing those back together, you know, that we receive from God, and then he calls us to do great work, but those those are supposed to flow together into one. But it has to. But I guess what I'm, the point I was trying to say here is that it all still has to start with the gardening, yes, right? Yes. Um, it has to start with prayer. Like we we we're called to active lives now by virtue of this life that we're that we're in. Like we have to go out there and work, or we have to go out there and, and fight a battle. If there's a battle to fight, we have to go out and save somebody or heal. We got to do stuff. There's the active life of the Christian. But the act of life is not to be in balance with prayer. It has to flow out of prayer. One of those has to come first. Our relationship with God, faith, hope, and love, the theological virtues, those have to come first. Those are the, those are the fertile soil that we have to tend with God. Yeah. And it's out of that grows our active life. And if we get that wrong, then we become, again, like those characters in Lord of the Rings that are trying to do things on their own. Yes. Trying to take matters into their own hands. We have to be like the gardener who works first with God, receives from God, and then and then grows from yes, there. It, yes, absolutely. It begins with that relationship with God. And even in the book of Genesis, Adam, before he is given the task of being the gardener, like he's, he's there with God. Like first there's the encounter with God right. and you know, God, yeah. God, at, you know, sees that he, he needs a partner and sees that it's not good for him to, to be alone and first calls him to a family. And then it's like, all right, now go cultivate the garden there. First, there's that relationship and then there's the, the yeah. work to do. And I know that that is something that you know, I struggle with because, you know, we're, we have busy lives and it just can be like work, work, work all the time. Got to take care of the kids, got to make the money. But first and foremost, it's about relationship. And yeah, you need the work to take care of those relationships. But first and foremost, it's about being a gardener because for most of our existence, once we get to eternity, hopefully, please God, um, <laughs> we won't need the healing and we won't need the, we don't, won't need to be healers and we won't need to be warriors. Like those are, those are temporary vocations for the here and now where there are wounds and battles. But as you said, first and foremost, we're called to be gardeners and we can't be gardeners until we know the one who created the garden first. Uh, I wanted to throw one more token uh, SAT word in there. Um, when yeah. you were describing how God, only God can create out of nothing and then we create yeah. from what he's created, Tolkien called that sub-creation, I think. Um, right. So anyway, that's just, a, a, I think, a cool way of understanding our own vocation of cre yeah. sub-creators within uh, God's hierarchy. Right. So. Yeah, that's ultimately, again, the more primary vocation. We're warriors not for the sake of war. Yeah. A, a, a Peeper, Joseph Pieper in his book... Um, leisure the basis of culture it makes a, a strong point of this like we don't we don't rest on the weekends to get ready for more work mm. that's to put life backwards right no no we we work in order to bring about leisure that's our ultimate vocation is to be in relationship to be with god to be at peace to be gardeners again right yes now because of the world we're in, like the hobbits, we have to leave the shire often and go work and go fight and go heal and go mend but ultimately, we're not doing those things for themselves. It's it's to come back again to be with God, to be with people, to love, to garden. Right. That's ultimately, um, that's what it's oriented towards. Awesome. Very good. Well, I think we are close to out of time here, so I want to I want to bring this in for a landing. Uh, is there is there anything else you just have to say about Lord of the Rings before we we end? There's so much we could say. Um, <laughs> there's so many things. Uh -huh. No, I think we hit all the main points. All right, that and I, I'm gonna I I'm gonna to talk about a few other points. I want I want to talk about um, Tolkien's disdain for industrialization. I want to talk a little bit of the the women specifically Aon, uh, and I want to talk about uh, the orcs and the humanity the orcs. So those are all things I will put in the patron mm. exclusive content uh, for this episode. Yes. If you want to be a patron, you can go to popculturecatechism.com and you can pick one of uh, six tiers of uh, giving. And not only does it help run everything here at Awaken Catholic, but then you also get exclusive content uh, with every episode and also all the talks that I do in my speaking ministry. Uh, so if you're not already a patron, uh, 
you know, consider becoming a patron, I want to give a special shout out to uh, the following patrons, all of our patrons, but specifically Carl and Melissa Gore and Lisa and Bob Tenney, Stephen, Maggie Hubbard and Tom and Emily Camberiotti. All right. So before we are done, I told my listeners at the end that I would leave them with uh, something applicable, how they could incorporate the gospel into their lives to today. So let's try to come up with just one thing that we're going to take away to try to live God's love and know God's love uh, better. You want me to go first? Or you want to go first? Sure. Sure. Go for it. All right. So I think the one that struck me the most to my heart was just the beauty of Frodo and Sam's friendship of Legolas and Gimli's friendship of, um, and of, of Aragorn's friendship with the hobbits, Merry and Pippin's friendship. And it's just reminding me of the power uh, of vulnerability, of tenderness, of sharing our burdens with one another. And I, I think sometimes as a, as a 30 something guy with a, a busy life and kids, it can be hard, even with my own wife to like take time to just work on our friendship. And especially with some of my other friends who are also busy with their lives. So I think, um, that was a good reminder for me and I need to take some time to really invest in those sort of world changing, life changing friendships. So that's my takeaway. Very nice. Um, I just want to reiterate something that we touched on in, in multiple different topics, but it's just this connection between, gosh, um, whether or not we're people who embrace reality or unreality, mm. and then that's that connection to whether we're walking with God or not, right? So in the, biblically, we have these two ways throughout scripture. It's referenced these two ways. You're either with God or not. You choose life or choose death, light or darkness. It's, it really is that simple. And it can feel like it's not that simple. Sometimes we get caught up in day-to-day -day life and it feels like, well, there's a million options, there's a million things I could be doing. There's, How do I know which one to take? How do I really know what it means to walk with God? And whenever we feel that, we need to recognize that at some level of our being, we've stepped away from reality. Like we've stepped back. We've stopped trying to peer into just things as they are, the reality of things. Because in reality, in this present moment, I'm either trying uh, to walk with God or I'm not. I'm either giving in to fear or desire or or some other reason uh, other than simply trying to be faithful in this moment. And there's a, there's a connection there, again, between whether we're people who make it a habit of being people of reality or not. And that's that virtue of prudence that we've talked about here and I'm always talking about over on Elevate Ordinary. The primary and ultimate uh, virtue, the wellspring of all other virtue, is this virtue of prudence which is whether or not we're, we're turning, we're, convert, we're having a conversion where we turn to reality again and again. Whenever things have gotten complicated, we turn back to just trying to see things as they are. The reality that God is the Lord and in this moment, there's, there's simply nothing else but the question of whether or not I'm with him, whether or not I'm trying to. I, I don't always have all the information. I don't have foresight. I can't see into the future. All I can see is that right here, right now, am I going to be honest? Am I going to be just? Am I going to be kind? Am I going to be courageous? That's the only question here and now. And if I do that, then God's will will be done through me. Wow. If I don't do that, it will still be done, but in spite <laughs> of me. <laughs> man. John Mark, this is why I love having you on the show. And this, this is how I can tell you are a man of prayer is because there are lots of people who can spout theology and philosophy and all those sorts of things, but you have a way of, of taking it and just like speaking to the, the core of the issue and how it relates to our heart. And it's just, uh, anyway, it's one of the things I love about you. Why I keep having you on the show, why I'm, I'm <laughs> Thanks, grateful bro. for you in my life. So I'm going to be listening back. Like as, as you were like, at one point you were like, are you still there? And I was like, yeah, it's just because my mind is blown by what you said. I'm definitely going to listen back to this episode because there's, I feel like there's so much in here that just I need to unpack and listen to. Aww, so, you're too good, man. You're yeah. too good. So uh, thank you for being here uh, with us, John Mark. Uh, where can the wonderful people find you? Well, I have a, just a very small website, johnmarkgrodi.com, which is, is simply just a, a place to get the other contact information or just to see the projects I'm involved in. There's not much there. But uh, the main thing I am involved in is I'm the executive director of the Coming Home Network International. I help people become Catholic. Uh, we have all kinds of resources in the community and, and people who want to work with you if you're thinking about becoming Catholic. So that's chnetwork.org. That's, that's my primary uh, work is there. Awesome. You can find me at MikeTennyMusic.com or at PopCultureCatechism.com. Follow me on social media as well. All that will be in the show notes. I want to give a couple shout outs. One to Forte Catholic run by my good friend Taylor Schroll, who was on our God of War episode. He is doing a three-part series uh, with uh, – 
tea with Tolkien uh, on Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Lord and uh, Return of the King, and also in preparation for the Amazon show. So I want to shout out them. Also, I'm much indebted. My, much of my insight about Lord of the Rings uh, comes from the Tolkien professor, um, who is a professor at uh, Washington College in Maryland. And if you go to TolkienProfessor.com.org, I forget which one. But I'll put it in the show notes. But he has all his lectures. Like he does an entire Tolkien seminar that goes through the Hobbit, the Silmarillion, the Lord of the Rings. I've listened to it at least twice, and it's excellent. So a lot of my insight is really uh, stolen from him. So go to the Tolkien professor, <laughs> and uh, he has lots of good stuff if you are into Tolkien. Thank you, listeners, uh, so much. Again, if you want to support this show, the, the best thing you can do really is to share this show. If this episode has touched you, share it with somebody, take a screenshot, share it on social media, and just say, hey, you guys got to check this out. Um, and if you really want to help us out and just you know keep the lights running sort of way, become a patron at popculturecatechism.com. We really appreciate it. And also, you can download the Awaken app. Awaken Catholic has an app that's free for anyone, and that's also a hub for all the shows. And it's a great Catholic music library, a Catholic prayer library in Latin, in Spanish, and English. And also, it's where you, if you're a patron, you get access to a lot of exclusive content, not just stuff that I create for my show, but other stuff that Awaken Catholic is doing as well. And the app is just about to get a huge, big update. So if you don't have the Awaken app, definitely make sure you go get it. Listeners of Pop Culture Catechism, I am so grateful for you. This will wrap up the end of season two. This will be episode 49, and we are about to start season three. I'm about to head out to Awaken Studios in September and film a bunch of new episodes. The show is growing. It is reaching more people. I'm getting awesome comments from people all the time. Lots of new um, reviews on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, whatever they're calling it now. So I just want to thank you for helping the show continue to grow. Thank you for your support, your kind words, your messages. Uh, I couldn't do it without you. I love you guys. And uh, thanks for walking this journey together. John Mark, we'll see you next time. Listeners, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.